probably my most controversial view. view. You ready for my most controversial view? This is one that gets everyone all riled up online anyhow. Is I don't think there's any... We're starting a new series, and we're going to be in Matthew 6.1 today. It's a topical series. Real quick, I've done this before. I'm going to do it again. But when you hear the... What do you say? Right. Everyone knows that, right? So there's things that we do at this church we repeat. And some people think when you repeat things that you don't mean them. And that is silly, okay? So after we'll read the text, a lot of times we say, this is the word of the Lord. Thanks be to God. The reason we do that, it's a confession. It's a reminder to ourselves. There's a lot of things that we do just to remind ourselves what it means, how true it is, to honor it, to set it apart from some things. And that's built into all of life. Whether it's marriage vows, sometimes when you've been married a long time, you renew your vows. But you're always renewing your vows in ways through patterns that you have in your life. And in worship and liturgy, there's an order to things. It's a purpose. We, we, we do confession and assurance of pardon. All this is to remind ourselves of the truth. So when I say, this is the word of the Lord, you say, thanks be to God. So that's why we do that. That's, uh, so if you're willing to you know, follow the lead of Freddie, Mer- Freddie Mercury... You know, grant me the same level. I know it's not, I know it's not football. It's just the worship of the triune God. But just hear me out, okay? Um, All right, our text today is a single verse. Matthew chapter 6, verse 1. It reads, beware of practicing your righteousness before other people in order to be seen by them. For then you will have no reward from your Father who is in heaven. This is the word of the Lord. Thanks be to God. Amen. Let's pray. Father, we ask that this word would be rooted deeply in it, uh, in us, and provide much fruit to your glory and to our good. In your son's name we ask. Amen. So again, today we're going to uh, begin a short topical series for the next few weeks that revisits the idea of holy habits. That's how, that's how we started this year, talking about that. Now, another name for holy habits, a uh, maybe older, more common name, is, is spiritual disciplines. Now, what do we mean by spiritual disciplines? Well, Don Whitney, he wrote a good book on the topic. I've had this one for a while. Uh, recommend it. It's called Spiritual Disciplines for the Christian Life. And he's got, some, he's got a few definitions really in it. And the one I like is that spiritual disciplines are those personal and corporate disciplines that promote spiritual growth. They are the habits of devotions and experiential Christianity that have been practiced by the people of God since biblical times. So we'll be looking at the spiritual disciplines broadly today, kind of an overview. And then in the coming weeks, we'll consider how those habits of devotion are lived out in our family life, our married life, and as individuals. Now this morning, I want us to consider three things. First, the biblical basis of spiritual disciplines. Second, the benefit of spiritual disciplines. And lastly, the two ditches or dangers related to spiritual discipline. So for the, uh, to begin, the biblical basis of spiritual disciplines. Uh, so look at our text again, Matthew 6, 1. Jesus warns, beware of practicing your righteousness before other people in order to be seen by them. For then you will have no reward from your father who is in heaven. It would be easy to misunderstand the point of this warning. He isn't saying, beware of practicing your righteousness. He isn't even saying, beware of practicing your righteousness before other people. I always tell people that the Bible says there is no God. And it does. It does say that. In Psalm 14.1, the fool says in his heart, there is no God. Context matters. You only have to remove or miss a few words Uh, to come to a wrong understanding of a passage of Scripture. Preachers die inside when we forget to say not, right? You know, sometimes we forget to add the not to do. You know, when we're telling someone don't do that, instead on accident, just there's a slip of the tongue, 
So one little word can change everything. The devil actually quotes Psalm 91 out of context in an attempt to get Christ to jump off a pinnacle. And he corrects them. 2 Peter 3.16, the apostle Peter, talks about the writings of Paul. And, and let this be a comfort to you who study scripture and sometimes you just go, I, I, don't, I, don't, I don't know. I don't know what that means. He says, there are some things in them that are hard to understand. So even the apostle Peter at times uh, struggled to understand what Paul was saying. And then he goes on to say, which the ignorant and unstable twist to their own destruction as they do the other scriptures. Some twist scripture out of an evil malice. False teachers do that. They do it on purpose. Some do it out of ignorance. They just don't know. A lot of bad ideas are simply a fruit of sloppy reading. And reading is really, really sloppy. Uh, probably the, the thing I see most nowadays is that however words, whatever feelings words invoke in you, give those words meaning. And that's just not true. Words have inherent meaning assigned to them inside uh, a culture, inside a group. They mean things, not just how you feel. I remember uh, someone wrote Flannery O'Connor uh, saying, here's my interpretation of your story. And Flannery O'Connor wrote back and said, well, that's not what it's about. <laughs> And nowadays, people think like they can, they can attribute meaning to something, even if that's not what it means. So again, the issue here isn't practicing righteousness or even doing it publicly. The key clause is in order to. Listen, beware of practicing righteousness before other people in order to be seen by them. The warning is about making your practice of righteousness into a show to get the praises of men. The action uh, isn't the issue. The attitude, the motivation, that's the issue. Being showy, being an actor. Our takeaway from Matthew 6, 1 shouldn't be that we are not to practice righteousness. Quite the opposite. Jesus assumes that we are practicing righteousness. Throughout chapter 6, he discussed almsgiving, prayer, and fasting. Verse uh, 2 in chapter 6, he says, so when you give to the poor. Verse 5, when you pray. Verse 16, whenever you fast. These disciplines are to be part of the Christian life. Christ assumes it. What he's doing is he's correcting the motive, not the method or the means per se, the motive. For the spiritual disciplines to be truly biblical, truly spiritual, they have to have the right motives. Christ gives the main motive right here in Matthew 6, 1, namely to receive the reward of a well-pleased heavenly father. Well done, good and faithful servant. Enter into your rest, right? Think of when you're a little kid and clean, you cleaned a room simply to be a blessing uh, to your, your mother or father. All you wanted was a smile, a hug, and a thank you. When I was little, I remember hearing my mom said she needed to clean the fish. So, being a little boy, I took the fish out of the aquarium, and I washed them down with soap. <laughs> the fish were very clean. They're, matter of fact, they were clean the rest of their life. So, <laughs> it's a simple but powerful motive, wanting to please someone that loves you, because you love them. We love because he first loved us. We practice our righteousness because it pleases our father. It's not about other people. It's about him. That's what it's about. Now, there's another motive, which we find in 1 Timothy 4, verse 7 through 8. Paul says, have nothing to do with irreverent, silly myths. Rather, train yourself for godliness. For while bodily training is of some value, Godliness is of value in every way as it holds promise for the present life and also for the life to come. The pastor John Wise preached this a couple months ago. Um, that's why I'm using Matthew 6 instead <laughs> as my proof text. This is where people usually go. You can go listen to John's exposition. It's much fuller. I only want to point out the motive here. The New American Standard Bible translates it, discipline yourself for the purpose of godliness. So the purpose is to be 
godly. And being godly is a big motive because it holds promise for the present life and also for the life to come. Hold that thought for a moment. In his book, Don Whitney opens with, discipline without direction is drudgery. And then he gives this great example. He gives an example of some little boy sitting in his bedroom. Uh, he's been told to, to practice his guitar. And so he's just playing the same chords over and over again, the chord progression, how, whatever you're taught. Uh, I don't know. I don't play anything other than a couple Coldplay songs on the piano that I learned from YouTube. But I don't know. Whatever you're taught to learn the guitar over and over and over and over again, right? And it's boring. It feels boring. But then an angel appears and translates them away to a concert hall. And there he sees all these people all dressed up, transfixed and listening to a classical guitarist up on stage, plucking away and doing amazing, beautiful things. And he's amazed. He's amazed by what the guy can, you know, he can make that guitar gently weep, right? He can make that guitar do uh, amazing things. And all the people love it. And then it's revealed to him, that's you. That's you 30 years from now, if you practice. And the kid's brought back home. Do you think, do you think he looks at practicing those chord progressions the same way? No. Not at all. Of course not. He sees the purpose, the direction that this discipline is going to. He sees the big picture. Scripture repeatedly uses the end result of our walk with Christ to encourage and motivate us along the way to that final destination. Beloved, now we are children of God, and it has not yet been revealed what we shall be, but we know that when he is revealed, we shall be like him, for we shall see him as he is. 1 John 3, 2. Philippians 1, 6, one of my favorite. Being confident of this very thing, that he who has begun a good work in you will complete it until the day of Christ. He is going to complete the work, and when he is completed, you're going to be like him. That's what you're working towards. Discipline without direction is drudgery. But the spiritual disciplines, rightly understood, have direction. The spiritual disciplines are about pleasing God and in doing so, becoming more like him. We, uh, we become like God. We don't become divine. Like our, our nature is not changing into something that's uh, beyond human. We're just being restored by the gospel, to what God made us to be. And to be more like him is to grow in godliness. And godliness is the key to the good life, both now and forever. You want the good life? You want to be godly then. That's the key to it. Paul says that godliness holds promise in this life and the life to come. Just as sinful practices bring down cursing upon your life. If you steal... If you're dishonest, if you're bad with money, your poverty is going to come on you. Judgment's going to come on you. If you live a disordered life with your body, it's going to catch up to you. It's going to. We know that even the commands given to us in Scripture, the Decalogue, the Ten Commandments, they're not pure law. They come with a promise. And there's a promise given to us that when we obey and honor our parents, that we're going to have a longer life. Longer, both probably in duration. I don't know how I'm still here. You know, I rode trains and jumped off train bridges and went miles away from, I I just know how any of us survive. It's amazing. But if we do survive, it's because our parents protect us. Athanasius, I'm sorry, son. You're you're a pastor's son. This happens from time to time. But I remember sitting with Emily at a hotel saying, I didn't know Athanasius could swim. And she said, he can't. And so I saw him at the bottom of a pool going like this. So I ran over there, and I jump, and I swim, and pull him back up. And I'm like, what are you doing? And uh, he thought it was a good idea. I guess he didn't comprehend that you eventually run out of air, you know. And as a parent, I'm just trying to keep my kids alive. Well, as we, the things that we do for our kids is to benefit and bless them. And when they listen to us, it does lead to usually a life in longer duration, but also in higher quality better life. 
When you obey God, there's promises that bless you in this life that continue on. And so just as sinful practices bring down curse upon your life, godly practices bring blessing. They bring blessing. Which brings me to the benefit of spiritual disciplines. There are many benefits that flow from the spiritual discipline. But I want to repurpose the saying of former Navy SEAL, Jocko Willinks, uh, to a high, like one of the big benefits. Willinks says, discipline is freedom. And I want to rework that ever so slightly to say that spiritual discipline is freedom. The life ordered by and around the pursuit of God is freedom. People that are enslaved to sin are not free. Think of creation. 1 Corinthians 14, 33 tells us that our God is a God of order and not of confusion. There, it's applying that fact to the worship services being conducted in an orderly way, but it extends to all reality. In Scripture, order means that everything is in its correct place and rank. The fact that God cherishes order in this way is clear in the first chapter of Genesis. It's uh, one of the very first things that we learn about God. When he creates the world from nothing, for a brief time, it was waste and void. As Calvin puts it, rude and unpolished, or rather, a shapeless chaos. Why would he make it this way? To order it and to provide a model for us to follow as we obey the creation mandate to rule, reign, and subdue. We're to live under God's order and to extend out his order further into the world. God fills the world with light. He divides the light from the darkness. By doing this, he also divides the cosmos into two fundamental realms, night and day. He divides the water from the waters, establishing two more realms, sea and sky. He fills the earth with uh, vegetation, or excuse me, he divides the water from the land, establishing another realm, uh, the, the earth that, where you can actually grow stuff. Uh, then he divides uh, the earth, or he fills the earth with uh, vegetation divided by kind. He fills the sky with stars and all that divided by magnitude. He fills the sea and the skies with swarms of creatures, divided by kind. He fills the earth with beasts, divided by kind. He divides man from the earth and then divides woman from the man. By the end of this process, the cosmos is no longer rude and unpolished, chaotic and confused. It's been ordered into something pristine and beautiful, something where peace reigns because everything is in its place. God himself declares that it's very good. In so doing, he also communicates a foundational principle uh, which underlies the whole process of dividing and filling, the principle of telos. It's four letters, but yet a $20 word. Telos is the end goal, the intended purpose, the aim or design of a thing. It is, in short, what a thing is for. Everything God makes has a telos, has a purpose, an end which it moves for. Another thing to note is that the entire world exists in a rhythm or a routine or kind of a circuit. And their telos or purpose is tied and expressed through that rhythm. Listen to the fourth day of creation. And God said, let there be lights in the expanse of the heavens to separate the day from the night. And let them be for signs and for seasons and for days and years. And let them be lights in the expanse of the heavens to give light upon the earth. And it was so. So the rhythm and movement of the stars have a purpose. Probably my most controversial view. view. You ready for my most controversial view? This is one that gets everyone all riled up online anyhow. Is I don't think there's any life in space besides earth. This thing is all dead, man. Everywhere we go, it's dead so far. Everywhere we look, you know. I mean, it's beautiful. But deadly, Jupiter is fun to look at, probably not safe to visit, you know. So everywhere I see is death. And they say, well, what's the purpose? What's the purpose of that expanse? Well, here's, here's one of the purposes. It, uh, it gives us signs and seasons for days and for years. The context there is like liturgical years or, or periods of worship or whatever. Uh, and they repeat on a routine and they help order life. Uh, I love to stargaze, 
one of my favorite apps is Night Sky or Star Chart, where you can just hold it up to the sky or, or look at the ground and see where all the different stars are. But I got to know all the stars down in the south. And I'd go in my backyard and I'd look at them, and uh, I could tell what time of year it was based on what stars, when I expected them to be there. And, and then I moved back up here after being in the south for some years, and the stars are different. <laughs> you know, they're in different places. And I had to adapt to it, but the stars brought order. They brought order, and they gave direction, and that's their purpose. Think of day and night. Mankind is diurnal. Uh, we are active during the day and sleep at night. The light helps us see what we're doing. We're not like cats. We, we don't bring in, well, we're not like cats, that, mainly that we're not a product of the devil, but um, we're also not like cats in that our eyes cannot absorb light the way they do, right? It, or it doesn't receive light in the same way. We, we need more light and the cats can get by with less. We're made to work during the day, and the sun helps us see what we're doing. Then we also need the night to get into deep sleep, to get in REM sleep, right? We don't, uh, part of, a lot of us aren't rested because we're usually sleeping in overly lighted rooms and our body can't get there. That's just part of our design. And so even the order of the day is meant to help us get work done and then to recover from it through deep restorative sleep. Think of the week. The week is six days of labor, followed by one day of spiritual rest. So we labor uh, throughout the week, and then we reset it. You, you lose that, that Sabbath where you're not like recovering, and it wears on you. We are made to live in a routine on a cycle of a sort. You change any of those things, and there are consequences. Think of COVID. Think of COVID. You remember what that was like, where you didn't go to church, and you didn't go to work. What day was any day? Who knew? They all just mixed together. It was very hard. It was very uh, confusing. There, the, it was like a month. You know, uh, I know they said it was 15 days, but it felt like one unending day, right? And it's this very confusing time. Think of, uh, if you ever put an all-nighter? I had to do that a couple times. Well, I didn't have to do it. I was so undisciplined in college that I had to pull all-nighter to get the paper done in time. Uh, well, that messes with your head, too. You're not, you're not normal. Think of out-of-town vacations with children, right? I hate to do out-of-town vacations with children because of the weeks after the vacations, right? Because so you go and you see your uh, grandparents and grandparents kind of antagonize you, not on purpose. They give you toys that make sounds, and they give your kids all sorts of food and let them stay up later. And whatever routine you built into their life is absolutely demolished when you go out of town and visit people. And then when you come home, you kid, your kids act like little demons for two weeks, and they, like, drive you nuts. And you have to, like, all right, you got to get disciplined, too. It's hard for you to get back in the schedule. It wrecks them. A purposeful routine brings order. And the lack of a purposeful routine will eventually lead to confusion and given enough time, chaos. Now, mankind has a telos. He has a purpose. All creation shares and participates and reflects one ultimate telos, to serve and bring glory to God. That's our purpose. Colossians 1, 16 through 18 says that all things have been created through him and for him, so that he himself will come to have first place in everything. Now, not only is there an ultimate telos, but each created thing participates differently in this ultimate telos, according to its unique place and design. We don't have the same purpose of stars, but stars have a purpose, and so do we. So that goes for us. We are made for service and worship of God. Now, fallen man rebels against this, this purpose, and orders their life around selfish pursuits and false worship. And the end result is a life defined by confusion, corruption, and chaos. So there's an order, and one way you can look, one way you can view creation, creation is made with order, fall brings disorder, and creation, recreation, restores us 
uh, ever, ever more to that order and consummation, the order is put perfectly how it will be forever. So you can actually view this sort of um, creation, fall, recreation, consummation matrix through the idea of order. And certainly that's part of it. So the, the fallen man, the, the rebellious man, the man given to his sin, he has a life where they're enslaved by their desires. And desires go up and down. And therefore they're thrown to and fro. The Christian, however, he doesn't go against the grain of design anymore. He goes with it. He orders his life according to God's purpose and rhythms. He has a life of spiritual discipline. Going back to our text, he practices his righteousness. He practices it. My wife was um, going through First John this week. It's part of the same page summer. And she was talking about just how con convicting it is. And I remember when I first read it, how confused I was. Because it would say, anyone who sins is not of God. And I was like, uh-oh. You know, I absolutely, I don't sin like I used to, but I still sin. And it helps when you look at some of the other translations that, you know, kind of pull out the meaning, which is really that anyone pra who practices sin, anyone whose life is defined by sin, willful sin and repeated sin, that person doesn't belong to God because his practice, the order of his life defines him. So when we see fornicators, drunkards, adulterers, idolaters, etc., etc., will not inherit the kingdom of heaven. It's not saying people that have done that even, pro, uh, even after salvation. You could fall into isolated events of that and still be a Christian. And if you are a Christian, through the conviction of the Holy Spirit, through the, the, the means of grace, the church, friends, whatever, you'll be convicted and leaded out, led out of that. Excuse me. And so that, that sort of practice is really what he's talking about here. It's willful and repeated, decisive action. It's a discipline. Hebrews 12, 11 says, for the, moment, uh, for the moment, all discipline seems painful rather than pleasant. Doesn't feel good. But later, it yields the peaceful fruit of righteousness to those who've been trained by it. You can think of that through the lens of physical discipline. That when you're working out, running, or correcting your diet, Sometimes in the moment, it's not, it's not pleasant. But later when you have strength and you feel good and you're not like those that have let their bodies get wrecked, it's one thing just to have the wear and tear of this fallen world. It's another thing to allow your body to be wrecked and you can't get up, you don't have energy, you can't breathe well, whatever. That's not very pleasant. But when you uh, live a life of discipline and order when it comes to health, there's a blessing. There's a, it's, it's, your, things work better. And so it is with spiritual things. Now, this is talking about fatherly discipline of God. That as he disciplines us, uh, it's painful, but in time it produces the peaceful fruit of righteousness. But you could apply it to self-discipline motivated by the Holy Spirit. It, too, yields the peaceful fruit of righteousness to those who have been trained by it. So, again, spiritual discipline is freedom. It is freedom from the chaos of a of a life defined by trends and fads as opposed to a life ordered around public worship. You know, one of my uh, things that I decided to do when I first became a Christian is to go to church every Sunday, no matter what. Now, I've only missed, I think, I had a count, but I lost it. Um, but it's like I've missed like 14 times or 16 times in 24 years. And I do it not to be saved, not because like God says, okay, you, you punched your church card enough time and you get a free, you know, you get a free trip to heaven. More that I just knew that hearing the word preached would convict me and not allow me to stray. And it has. God is so faithful to convict you when you sit in the sermons. So when you order your life around public worship, it brings a, a basic order to everything. It's freedom through worry or from worry through prayer. People that are driven and controlled by anxiety and worry are usually not prayerful people. Because when you pray about things, you offer them up to God. You cast your cares upon him, for he cares for you. And I can't explain it. It's a, it's a peace that surpasses understanding. But when you pray to God, 
God comforts you and strengthens you for this life. The discipline of prayer will bring that peace. It's freedom from the lack of clarity. How do you know what's what? How do you know what, what matters? Well, by studying the Bible, by being in God's word, day after day, week after week, years after years, it gives you clarity on uh, what's true, what's not true, what matters, what doesn't matter. It's freedom in a thousand ways. And you have to ask yourself, look at your life. Do you functionally lack the peaceful fruit of righteousness, of righteous living, of living according to God's plan? Well, it's probably because you've not been trained by discipline. And one thing that we hope that comes out of this series uh, is that you will be, that you'll, you'll be motivated. And also we can give you some models, some ways to practice these disciplines in your life. That's the goal. Which brings me, though, to two ditches or dangers related to the spiritual discipline. One, uh, and this one, I don't know how much of a temptation this is in our church, but I'm going to bring it up anyway, mysticism. Mysticism is where you get lost in the inner life. So a lot of these spiritual disciplines require uh, kind of the inner life, prayer, Bible study, meditation, consideration. And it, you can go to a place where it really the disciplines are achieving a state of mind or a feeling. I remember this girl visited our first church plant, and it was in a, it was in a dim, dimly lit theater, which I now see was a bad idea. Uh, but she said, this doesn't feel like church. And well, what does church feel like? Well, for her, it wasn't that we didn't have liturgy or the word preach or anything like that. It just didn't feel like you're walking into a sacred space because it didn't have the windows and altars. She was from a, a older, uh, from a Greek Orthodox tradition, and that's what she was looking for. And a lot of times we can let our feelings, like, I don't feel close to God. I don't feel the presence of God. I really felt the presence of God in worship. Or I didn't feel the presence of God in worship, therefore it wasn't good, right? You'll hear that sort of, um, that, that sort of, uh, verbiage. And you'll see that with, with people in spiritual discipline, like, how's your prayer life going? I just don't feel close to God. And there's a guy named Thomas Akempis that got really popular. And he's kind of a, I don't know, I wouldn't say the father of contemplative prayer, but one of the guys, it's a method. And I uh, read one of his adherents, a, a lady talking about uh, how she viewed spiritual disciplines and prayer in particular. She said, if I didn't have feelings of weightlessness, lightheadedness, floating, and being enraptured while uh, contemplating, I felt dead and empty inside. All the contemplative literature I read encouraged being lost in inner spirituality and to ignore the dead feeling. The imitation of Christ by Thomas Akempis became a second Bible to me. From my research, what I was experiencing was common among Christians who practice contemplative prayer. There are priests, nuns, monks, saints, ministers, religious leaders, historical figures, celebrities, and people from all walks of life and faith who practice this form of inner esoteric spirituality. So there is a sense where we do get lost in wonder as we're studying scripture, uh, but it's not, it's not uh, unguided. It's, it's got an aim. It's got a purpose. And you can, th you can see this in our approach to public worship uh, most, where uh, really how we engage with the, the music. If it's not plucking at our heartstrings, then the worship wasn't good. And again, you can see that in Bible study. Some mornings when I read my Bible, I don't immediately have any great thoughts from it. I, just, I read through it and I think, huh, okay, that was weird. And then I go on through the day, and sometimes something clicks, and sometimes something doesn't. And, but I did read it, and it is in the back of my mind, bouncing around, and it, it might click that day, and it might click way down the road. I don't know if you've ever been talking to someone, and a verse is just in storage, and it's just the right time, and, and then you bring it out right away. And it was stored in there. You hid it in your heart just by studying God's word. And so if you read the Bible and pray every day, it's just going to be this, uh, you know, lightheadedness, like, you know, happy-go-lucky joy skipping through life every day. No, 
And don't, don't get lost in that. A good analogy for mysticism is a shovel and buried treasure. When pursuing a, a treasure, we use the shovel to get the treasure. Mysticism is where uh, we fall in love with the shovel, where it's all about the shovel, not the end, not the treasure. And these things are a means to get to God, and they're not the ends in themselves. So beware of that. Then there's legalism. In legalism, this is a ditch which makes a very similar mistake. It uses discipline as a way to gain standing with God, to, to say, I'm a good person apart from God. God owes me. Spurgeon says, I must take care above all that I cultivate communion with Christ, for though that can never be the basis of, of peace, mark that, yet it will be the channel of it. So it will never be the basis. Our spiritual discipline isn't what gives us right standing with God. It's Christ and Christ alone and what he did through his perfect life, his death on the cross, and his resurrection and victory over death and Satan. That's, when that's applied to us by faith, which is an instrument and a gift, then that's what gives us right standing with God, where God says, you're no longer guilty, you're innocent, you're justified. But it is a channel. And one way to think about it is I can flip a switch but I don't provide electricity. I can turn on a faucet, but I can't make the water flow. Uh, there will be no light and no liquid refreshment without someone else providing it. And so it is in a limited sense for the Christian with the ongoing grace of God. His grace is essential for our spiritual life, but we don't control the supply. We can't make the grace flow, but God has given us circuits to connect and pipes to open in case it's there. Our God is lavish in his grace, often liberally dispensing his favor without even the least bit of cooperation and preparation on our part. Think of your love of your children. I was thinking about changing baby diapers and how it's one of the most illogical things of all time. A kid is literally in their own feces and you're trying to change their diapers and they're fighting you. Stop. <laughs> you know, they're kicking at you. You're like, I'm trying to clean you. And that, that kid is not earning your love in that moment, but they're yours. They belong to you. They bear your image and the image of the one you love. And we've been reborn. And God loves us. And a lot of times we're like that little baby kicking on the changing table. Nothing we do, nothing we do warrants his love. Now, as we grow older and we ask, may I have a glass of water? Then you hand your child a glass of water. And so the spiritual disciplines are like that. It's asking God for things. God says, this is a way to connect with me through prayer, through studying his word. He's happy to pour out on you through these regular channels. Now, what keeps us from spiritual disciplines? Don Whitney says, the first thing that comes to mind, of course, is relentlessness of our schedule and the avalanche of our responsibilities. And certainly this is part of the battle. When we feel overloaded with life, which is most of the time, an exhortation to practice the spiritual disciplines can make us feel like an exhausted juggler struggling to keep half a dozen family heirloom plates in the air while someone is trying to toss a few more. That's how a lot of people feel. Like, where will I find the time for that? Right? Where will I find the time for that? I'm already so busy. But when you prioritize, when you prioritize the spiritual disciplines, again, it brings an order and peace to your life that allows you to work in a very different way. There's a difference between uh, working from rest and, and working from anxiety and worry and rush. And the spiritual discipline, uh, they anchor us in Christ. The other thing is, we say we don't have time for spiritual disciplines. But I just, don't, I just don't believe it. I think uh, our devotion to TV, Facebook, Netflix prove that we regularly do have discretionary time. And if you want to know how much time you have, start tracking it. You know, track it. You've got screen time on your phone. Track it on your TV. Just write it down. See where all this time is going. You know, I always think about, think about church attendance. I thought about this before I was ever a pastor. Everyone thinks this is personal to pastors, it is, and it is. Um, but 
if some people miss Sunday service in a given year, uh, or miss work as often as they miss Sunday service in a given year, I wonder if they'll still have a job. I wonder about it. You know? What is your priorities? Now, that can feel like a guilt trip. You know? And usually sin makes you feel guilty. When we don't pray, we feel guilty. Now, it's not saying that we would earn God's favors to that, but ask yourself, do you feel at peace? Do you feel connected to God? Does your life bear the peaceful fruit of righteousness? Would you start to observe these things? Ask these questions. Build your life around, around God. I think it's amazing how much time God has blessed us with in a given week. And it's also amazing that spiritual things are so rich that it's not like, all right, uh, let's say you watch an hour of Netflix. Does that mean you have to read the Bible for an hour? Not necessarily because prayer with God is so rich. 15 minutes in prayer, sincere prayer with God, brings so much benefits to your life. 15 minutes in scripture brings so much benefit. The, the, the goal here is not just more. That's not what I'm trying to say. The goal here is a life of discipline ordered around the things of scripture. Just a, a steady amount of this every day. A little prayer every day. A little Bible every day. A little fellowship every day will change your entire life. He's got this great quote um, that he opens his book with. Whitney, that is. This is uh, V. Uh, Raymond Edmond, and I don't know who that is. But he's got a great quote. Ours is an undisciplined age. The old discipline are breaking down. Above all, the discipline of divine grace is derided as legalism or is entirely unknown to a generation that is largely illiterate in the scriptures. We need the rugged strength of Christian character that can only come from discipline. I love that. The rugged strength of Christian character. This doesn't have to be legalism. It can be freedom. It can be freedom. An order to your life. A life full of joy and rest. I always think about the Sabbath. Not everyone agrees on that here. But... uh so it's legalism for me to worship every Sunday and spend time only with other Christians I love. Well, I can deal with that legalism. That's awesome. To feast and worship and spend time together, you know? I have another analogy, but it's, man, it's not a mixed crowd one. So you'll just have to ask me about it. Probably come up in the one on marriage. But uh, anyhow, look, spiritual discipline is freedom. As we go through and talk about these things, I hope we can anchor this in grace and make it clear that this isn't about going deeper in yourself or earning God's salvation, but experiencing the goodness of God's design through the grace poured out in Jesus. Let's pray. Father, we thank you for your word. We thank you that it's true and good. Lord, you've shown us even in this time where our life is out of order, and not in line with you. God, we thank you that it's your Holy Spirit that convicts us and leads us into new life. Lord, I pray for uh, this greater victory and strength through your Holy Spirit that those uh, that aren't uh, drinking from your refreshing waters or eating from your food and therefore are famished and weak, God, would come and be strengthened and encouraged and readied. Lord, I pray those that are weighed down with worry, with anger, with all these feelings of depression would take their concerns and their grievances and lay them before you, Lord, and allow you through prayer to work on their heart and bring them in line with your reality, God, with your truth of your word. And in doing so, God, that they would not have a bad conscience and they wouldn't be full of depressing thoughts, but they would have the confidence that only comes from communion with you, Lord. I ask this in the name of your son, Jesus. Amen. Amen.